Greetings to my friends and colleagues of the Palo Alto Peninsula AGO. Greetings also to any organ friends and enthusiasts joining us nationally and worldwide on the internet. Wishing you all a very happy Louis Vierne 150th birthday. We celebrate today the person who many people call the greatest French organ composer of the first several decades of the 20th century. Legally blind from birth, but partially sighted due to congenital cataracts, Vierne was a native of Lille near the Belgian border, north of Paris, and his earliest education, 1881 to 1890, was at the Institution des Jeunes Aveugles in Paris, where he learned with the Braille system. In the fall of 1890, he was accepted into César Franck's organ class at the Paris Conservatoire. In Vierne's words, improvisation was much more interesting than performance to Franck, so five of six hours of, per week of instruction were spent on improvisation. Vierne's classmate was Charles Tournemere, who is also having his 150th birthday this year. Vierne admired Tournemere's improv prowess. Tournemere and Vierne started their study in Franck's class October 4, 1890. Two weeks later, Franck went out on medical leave and he died November 11. Vierne felt crushed and wrote that he had the horrible feeling of having lost his father a second time. In December, Franck's successor at the conservatoire was named, Charles Marie Vidor, who was largely an unknown. Vidor was going to have to fill an enormous void. Vidor had been trained by Jacques Lemons in Belgium and found it ridiculous that performance was neglected for improv training. So, all of a sudden, learning J.S. Bach was a vital part of their schooling in the organ class, and they played Bach slowly, as well as learning Vidor movements, Toccata and Scherzo from Symphony Four and Intermezzo from Six. Eventually, they learned Franck organ works, too. After one school year, Tournemur, the virtuoso and imaginative improviser, won first prize. Vierne earned second along with another colleague. The following year, Vierne became a teaching assistant, teaching the auditors in Vidor's class. In February 1892, he became Vidor's deputy or suborganist at Sansel Peace, and he loved his time on the Sansel Peace Cavalle Cole. The second year of school, despite being sure that he had won, Vierne still got just second prize. These decisions often were politically motivated, like the jury boycotting Vidor's students. Same thing third year, another second. At the end of his fourth year, Vierne finally earned his unanimous first prize as the anti-Vidor studio clique was silenced. In 1896, when Theodore Dubois became the director of the conservatoire, Vidor took over his composition class and Alexandre Guillemont became the organ professor. Vierne continued as tutor. Guillemont's imagination was not Vidor's, but he was a master of the fugue. He was also a colorist, and as a touring concert organist had much experience in registering many organs. In addition to Bach and Franck, Guillemont also taught Vidor and eventually Vierne works. When Guillemont took leaves of absence in 1896 and 1902 for American concert tours, Vierne took sole charge of the organ class. Vierne's younger brother, René, also got first prize in Guillemot's class in 1906. It must be said that Vidor was like a supportive dad to Vierne all through his life, encouraging him to help teach in the conservatoire, become his assistant at Sansel Peace, take the interim organ position at Notre Dame, and eventually compete to be titulaire there. Even when Notre Dame was in World War I disarray and the organ severely needing renovation, Vidor was there to be supportive. Vierne and Guillemot were also close and mutually supportive. 
when a clergy-run organ renovation during Guillemot's absence at Trinité became a scandal, Vierne made Guillemot honorary organist with him at Notre Dame. In the few years leading to his time at Notre Dame Cathedral, Vierne wrote his first organ symphony in D minor, published in 1899. The famous finale, one of our favorites, he dismissed as being his Marseillaise and in dubious taste. One of his favorite movements was the first movement, which even in his young adult years illustrates wrestling with the struggles of life. Chase Olson will now perform for you the prelude of Symphony One, played at St. Mary's Cathedral in San Francisco.
played the Notre Dame organ at age 23 in a special class organized by Vidor. He felt great joy and noted that since the console was seven feet from the case, the organ sounded clearer to the player than at Sansel Peace, where the console is within the organ. Don't forget that in 1893, Notre Dame still has an authentic 1868 tracker action Cavalier Cole, similar to Sansel Peace. In 1900, Notre Dame's organist was succumbing to cancer, and Vidor convinced his student Vierne to accept the offer of interim organist. Vierne was reticent because he so loved and knew the Sansel Peace organ. With the encouragement, he accepted the assignment and loved the chance to fully tonally explore the instrument, and he fell in love with this organ as well. After the death of the titular organist, a competition was held. Again, Vierne was hesitant, this time because of being married a year and now having a one-month-old son. Vidor convinced him to apply. That made a total of five applicants who auditioned in May 1900. He won unanimously. Two of the jury of eight were Vidor and Guillemot, as well as Gigou. The previous titulaire, had not been a strong organist. Hence, all were looking to Vierne to elevate the Notre Dame organ to the glory and prestige of past centuries. Vierne's second symphony in E minor was written in this early Notre Dame year period, 1901 to three, and is the first of his symphonies to be cyclical or have a theme that shows up in more than one movement, thereby unifying the work. I will play you the second movement, Chorale, which starts with a gentle hymn-like theme, followed by a stormy theme, a second appearance of each of those themes, then a triumphant final section. <laughs>
had a rough life, full of setbacks and heartaches, some secondary to his handicap of being blind. For instance, in 1906, at the age of 36, he was out walking after a rainstorm, and he badly twisted his ankle in a hidden pothole. In fact, his ankle was severely broken, a Dupuytren's fracture that 99% of the time led to amputation. His devoted orthopedic surgeon knew what was at stake and successfully saved the ankle and foot. But Vierne had to totally relearn his pedal technique from scratch. Vidor's 10 symphonies led to Vierne's six symphonies, but these two greats show different personalities in their music. Vidor, like an architect, constructs imaginative music, often with a very dry sense of humor. Vierne, however, wears his heart on his sleeve. In the summer of 1911, Vierne was going through a particularly painful time. His marriage of 10 years had ended in divorce. His mother had died. And not only had he lost his close friend and colleague Guillemot, who had died, but he was especially unhappy that they passed over him to Pic Gigou as Guillemot's successor teaching the organ class at the Paris Conservatoire. Vierne spent that summer at the home of the Dupres with young Marcel Dupre and Dupre's parents, writing Symphony III in F-sharp minor. Many think Symphony III may be his best symphony, as it is well constructed in its entirety. The first movement I like to call a musical temper tantrum. He is livid. The movement I am going to play for you is the finale, which also sports a stormy feel. One thing I love about Vierne's music is that even with the stormiest of movements, Vierne is an optimist, and the sun always comes out at the end of the day. I am playing the Casavant organ at the Congregational Church of San Mateo.
fashionable for the organist composers of the 1800s and early 1900s to write collections of smaller, more accessible works for organ or harmonium. This music was written on two staves and included optional pedals. It was written to encourage amateurs, but more practically, it was for organ subs who felt more comfortable on harmonium than on the big church organ. During the summer of 1913, Vierne wrote his 24 pièces en style libre, one in every major and minor key. And this collection is perhaps the most successful of anyone's in this genre. Edward Lee will now play number one, Preambule. Interestingly enough, in 1927, when Vierne took his one and only American concert tour, he brought his repertoire some of his most accessible compositions. Isaiah Rosbach will perform number three, Complaint. Both Preambule and Complaint 
were on the program that Vierne played in the New York Wanamaker Hall. moment about Vierne's harmony. Vierne is a bridge composer coming out of 19th century romanticism and heading for 20th century atonality and dissonance. However, more importantly, he is a contemporary of French impressionists Debussy and Ravel. So using chromatics, modal scales, and whole tone harmonies are an important part of his sound. Natalie Pack will now play number 14, Scherzetto, and listen particularly to Vierne's clever harmonic shifts.
harmonium, a positive pressure reed organ, so very popular in France, was a common home instrument as well as frequently a substitute for the organ in churches. In America, our pump organ is a negative pressure reed organ and a close cousin to the harmonium. When you pump, you create a vacuum which uses suction to sound the reeds. I shall perform number 19, Berceuse, on our family SD pump organ, which very well may date from a similar era as the pièce en style libre. struck France hard, and 1914 to 18 were painfully difficult years. Even Notre Dame Cathedral sustained bomb damage in the front just outside the organ loft because the Germans were convinced that secret military operations were being concealed there. The rose windows were removed as a precaution, hence the organ loft was open to the elements year-round, pushing it further and further into disrepair. 
World War I was personally painful to Vierne as well, as he lost his son Jacques, an underage soldier on the front, as well as Vierne's younger brother, organist René Vierne. During these years, Vierne's poor vision is going further downhill, as his congenital cataracts are being complicated with glaucoma. He spent 1916 to 20 in Switzerland with multiple eye procedures trying to save what little was left. In his absence from Notre Dame, Marcel Dupre is being a more than a bit opportunistic in trying to take over as titulaire. Symphony IV in G minor was written in 1914 and first came out at the end of the war. Not surprisingly, Vierne's harmonic language is becoming more densely chromatic and darker and more poignant. Jean Kyung Lim recently performed the entire Fourth Symphony at St. Mary's Cathedral in San Francisco. And here is the happiest of all the movements, the lovely third movement, Menuet.
Björn wrote his monumental Fifth Symphony in A minor in the years 1922 to 25. And like the second and fourth, and eventually the sixth symphony, it is cyclical, meaning a common theme appears slightly altered from movement to movement, unifying the work. The amiability of earlier symphonies has become disillusioned, full of poignancy and despair, and colored with thick chromaticism. Between his fifth and sixth symphonies, which both use a lot of expressive chromaticism, Vierne wrote 24 pièces de fantaisie in four suites. This is where Vierne is his most impressionistic. The French impressionist movement in the visual arts portrayed the world around them as it was seen. Yet Vierne, being blind, is seeing in his mind's eye. A number of pieces like Nyad, or water nymphs, are mythologically inspired. I will now play for you Etoile du Soir, Evening Star, from Suite 3. Imagine a blind man showing you musically how a star twinkles.
Next, Dwayne Subaru will play you the eternal favorite, the last fantasy piece of Suite 3, Carillon de Westminster. Based on the sequence of the Westminster Quarter, the smaller bells that lead to the chiming of the Big Ben bell on the hour, music historians have been obsessed over time that the opening theme isn't exactly the theme of the real bells. There is a perhaps apocryphal legend that Bjorn called Henry Willis III long distance across the English Channel, and either Henry Willis didn't tell him correctly, or that Bjorn didn't hear him clearly. Or was it simply artistic license? No matter, it is a masterful French toccata with enduring beauty.
years it was attempted to get Louis Vierne to do a concert tour in America. The one and only tour finally happened January to March of 1927, an 80-day trip crossing both Canada and the United States by train, and 50 concerts in those 80 days. In the summer of 1930, Vierne composed his final symphony, Symphony 6 in B. Like symphonies 2, 4, 5, it is cyclical. Like symphonies 4 and 5, it has a sense of darkness and severity. It ends with a brilliant toccata in B major, which shows his eternal optimism in the face of struggle. To my ears, the finale has echoes of his American expedition with a New York flavor. Here is his finale now.
June 2, 1937, was to be Louis Vierne's final concert at Notre Dame. The church had decided that the organ should be used only for worship and had so forewarned him. He shared the program with young organist Maurice Duraflay. First, Vierne would play his triptyque, Matine, Communion, and Stelle pour un enfant des feux, then improvise. The second half was Durafle playing four of Vierne's fantasy pieces, followed by the aria and finale of Symphony VI. Witnesses reported that Vierne did not look well that evening, but made a superhuman effort to get through the triptyque. Before the improvisation, Vierne said he could no longer see the keys. He inhaled from his bottle of smelling salts. His foot slipped as he passed out, playing a low E in the pedal. He was gone, having suffered a massive heart attack. On the bright side, he died doing what he loved best, playing his beloved Notre Dame organ. The bench on which he died is one of the touching relics of the Notre Dame Organ Tribune. For all of you organists, Vierne is a phenomenal composer to invest in. For his easiest and most accessible compositions, explore in the pièce en style libre. The earlier symphonies and the fantasy pieces are all well worth the effort and as a starting place to launch into his deeper, more complex symphonies. Many thanks to my organ colleagues, Jean Kyung Lim and Dwayne Subaru, as well as the young organists, Chase Olson, Natalie Pack, Edward Lee, and Isaiah Rosbach for sharing their beautiful performances as part of this celebration. Thank you also to the Congregational Church of San Mateo and St. Mary's Cathedral in San Francisco, where these performances were recorded. Thank you, lastly, to Robert Cross, who recorded all but one of the performances and who has built this video production. Wishing you all a happy Louis Vierne 150th birthday. <laughs>